Into your hands, O oh, merciful Savior, we commend your servant, George. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive, George, into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. And now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be on you and remain with you in this world in which we live this day and forevermore. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.
W. Bush for hooked up quite a bit at the end. It was very emotional, very moving. The four men uh, that the former president, the late president George H. W. Bush, picked to eulogize him here at the National Cathedral, all addressed different parts of his biography. You had John Meacham, the historian and journalist, talking about uh, Bush focusing uh, to a large degree on his service in the military during World War II. You had uh, the former, former Canadian Prime Minister Brian Mulroney talking about Bush the statesman, Bush the world leader. And you had former Senator Alan Simpson talking about Bush as a friend. And lastly, of course, George W. Bush talking about his father as a dad. And now the Bush family, they, I know they hate it when journalists or others use the term dynasty, but it is a family that has uh, service gone through four generations now, starting with Senator Prescott Bush, uh, who was a senator from Connecticut from the 50s to the 60s. His son, George H.W. Bush, uh, has now gone, and George W. Bush is now the family patriarch. That, that rests with him now, that responsibility, that duty, and you heard him speaking at the funeral on behalf of all the Bush children, uh, his brothers uh, Neil and Jeb and Marvin, his sister Doro, ref referencing his late sister Robin, uh, speaking on behalf of, of his children and their children, George W. Bush is now the patriarch of this family. And this uh, motorcade uh, will leave the Washington National Cathedral, head towards Joint Base Andrews right outside of Washington, D.C. And interestingly, Jake, it will drive past the World War II Memorial here in Washington, D.C. Won't stop, but drive past uh, the World War II Memorial, President uh, George H.W. Bush being uh, part of that uh, greatest generation that fought in World War II. The Anabash is just outside the Washington National Cathedral. Uh, I, I understand the 3,000 or so guests, uh, they'll be emerging fairly soon. That's right, they will be. Right now, the doors are, are, are closed to the people who are inside to the guests as we look at it and we wait for the hearse to go along with the motorcade to leave here, as you said, Wolf, uh, to leave and go past the World War II Memorial to Joint Bates Andrews and leave Washington for the very last time for the 40, 41st president of the United States. And I have to say, just sitting out here watching this, frankly, regal ceremony, uh, the casket coming down, his family coming behind him and watching the 43rd president in particular stand on those steps looking down at the casket of his father knowing that he had just delivered probably the hardest speech of his life uh, one that he dreaded giving knew he would have to give for a long time and doing it in the building this this extraordinary cathedral where he has personal history uh, with his own presidency, giving the speech that he had to give after 9-11 and the, that moment that Jamie Gingell has shared uh, where his father inside those very pews reached over and grabbed his hand in a gesture of fatherly love. Uh, and, and now you see him, you can see the picture there, certainly uh, probably a sense of relief <laughs> that he got through it, uh, th this, this incredibly important speech that he had to give for his father. So we're sitting here watching the honor guard, waiting for the hearse to depart the National Cathedral for the last time. And they'll be heading, as we say, over to Joint Base Andrews uh, and then the flight to Houston, Texas, uh, and later tomorrow uh, over at Texas A&M University uh, in uh, College Station, Texas, uh, where the 43rd, uh, 41st president of the United States will be buried uh, alongside his wife, Barbara Bush, uh, and uh, we'll, of course, have extensive live coverage of that as well. Mm -hmm. um, this town lacks humor to break up tense moments, uh, to break up tough moments. Uh, this town lacks it sorely right now, and to see it play out in such an important setting in such a decent way, uh, and also the substance. It was very substantive in the sense that when you heard Alan Simpson talk about the tough domestic decisions President Bush had to make to raise taxes, Brian Mulroney talking about when the wall came down, when Mandela was freed. Well, the big things Bush had to deal with. I thought just a wonderful, classy encapsulation of the man, his career, and just who he was as a person. You, you don't hear, I mean, to John's point, Gloria, you don't hear much humility, you don't hear much humor uh, from the White House, certainly, these days. It was, certainly was a different kind of perspective that George H.W. Bush had. Everything about this was, was, was different. I think to me, in listening to all of these things, it was particularly John Meacham's speech, 
it see, which was remarkable. Um, it seems to me that the message that came across about George W. H. W. Bush was, was not only did character count, but character was everything, everything in his life. And you look at the language that it in use, no occupant more courageous or honorable. Uh, his life's code said, tell the truth, don't blame people, be strong, do your best, try hard, forgive, stay the course, that is from Meacham. And, you know, in praising Bush this way, it can't help but sound like a critique of the current occupant of the office, but I don't really think it was. I think people were just praising this man as he, as he lived his life and not necessarily making a comparison to the world in which we live, in which this does not exist in, in large doses uh, because Bush was so singular that way. So in every story everybody told, it was about the way this man lived his life with decency and, and with integrity, and that is the way he governed, and that is the way he was trusted, not only by people in this country, but as Mulroney put it, all around the world that every world leader felt that way about him. So I, I think it was an ode to the man's essence. David? You know, I, I, we can't all identify with, you know, what it is to be a president or to have a father who is a president, but we can identify with them as people going through relationships in their lives just like we all do, uh, with our spouses, with our siblings, with our kids, with our parents. Um, I remember George W. Bush uh, talking about a note that he had written to his teenage daughters saying there's nothing I can do nothing you can do to get me to stop loving you so please stop trying <laughs> and he talked about unconditional love his father's unconditional love for him despite the testing that he put his own father through and whatever the complications were in that relationship as we all have complications with our fathers what really stood out to me was the 43rd president of the United States talking about how much his dad loved him, no matter what. Right. And when he was president, when they shared that amazing moment in history, there was that unconditional love. After 9-11, it was there with uh, of a touch of his forearm. Um, and, and that's something that we can all identify with, uh, what those feelings are like and what this day is like to lose your parent. Uh, I want to go back to uh, Dana Bash, who's joined by Jamie Gangel, who was at the inside the cathedral. Uh, Dana? Thanks, Anderson. Jamie, just what was it like to be in those walls? You know, obviously, it was very emotional. Uh, I, I think what was probably the most remarkable moment was obviously former President George W.'s speech. And I've seen him do this before. He steals himself to get through the moment. And you could see that through most of the speech. He was, he didn't want to cry. And then at the end, he did cry, and the entire front row, the family, was was crying as well. James Baker was crying. And then, you know, you don't normally hear applause mm -hmm. after a eulogy or a tribute at a funeral, a memorial service. But not only did everyone applaud, they did for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I think that was partially for the father and everything that his son had said about him, but also because I think people appreciated the moment of the son having to stand up yep. there and do that and knowing it wasn't easy and in effect cheering him on that, that he did it. And, and that was a remarkable moment. And he didn't just cry. He, he wept with his whole body. Right. He had to move back from the lectern. Um, you know, everybody could feel it with him. Obviously, didn't feel what he was feeling, but but it was so clear, as you said, how he felt um, and how he was holding on till that last sentence, and he knew it was there, and he just couldn't hold it anymore. Particularly talking about his sister that he lost, right? And and at the end, saying that his father would be able to hug his sister Robin now and be able to hold his mother's hand. Um, I think the other thing that was very nice about all of the tributes was there was a mixture of humor. No question. In it. So uh, when George W. Bush said, my father only had two speeds, full throttle and sleep, everybody 
uh, in the cathedral laughed at that when he made the joke about his father liking humor and liking a good joke. And that's why he had Alan Simpson make one of uh, the speeches. So I think you really had a sense of not just the president, but the man. What did we hear over and over? Friendship, loyalty. So there were the themes about the, it was very personal in addition to being a state funeral. So I was in there for John McCain's funeral. Right. The big difference was the current president of the United Correct. States. Correct. What was it like to have him in the room with his uh, with his wife, the first lady? So what I noticed, what, two things. All the presidents, the president's club, as, as we call it, were talking at the beginning before President Trump and Melania came in. And they were reminiscing. I saw at one point Hillary Clinton was talking to Lynn Cheney. It was very friendly. There was a lot of, of chit-chat going on. But when President Trump and Melania came in, it was starkly different. Uh, President Obama shook his hand. Uh, Michelle Obama, former first lady, said good morning. And that was it. And then turned and looked forward. And there was, there was, the others did not greet him. Uh, former President George W. Bush, the son, went over and shook his hand when he came. But there was a stark contrast. And there is no question. I, I think no one is surprised about that. And just, the, they're showing the, the uh, images of what you were just describing so we can see it again. And that There's was one that. other thing I want to point out. Yeah. Hillary Clinton. She never looked to her right. No. Ever. Um, look, I mean. And President Clinton, who shakes everybody's, you know, hand, he, he did not. It's tough. Reach over Jimmy Carter down at the end, who's actually had more kind words at times for, for President Trump, didn't, didn't look down. So, th so that was very different. I think the other thing that uh, no doubt will be discussed is while President Trump's name was never said in any of the speeches, the tributes to former President Bush, every word, every adjective, every anecdote stood in stark contrast to this presidency. And I think we're going to be talking a lot about exactly. that. Exactly. And, and, and I genuinely don't think it was intentional at this funeral. No, they I think were it was just describing the late president, the 41st president, and it is it is what it is. Correct. When it, in different. making the tribute, yeah. it was another time, another person, and it couldn't have been more stark. Thank you, Jamie. Sure. Anderson, back to you. Dana, thanks very much. Uh, David Gergen, as we watched that picture of, of all the presidents, I, I was watching former President Obama uh, in this image, and I couldn't help but uh, we've all been in situations where we're in an awkward seat and sort of awkwardness is happening around us. He seems to, maybe I'm projecting onto it, but he seems to kind of have almost a slight smile on his face, sort of aware of the awkwardness that he is in the buffer position here. I think that's true. I, I, and it was remarkable just to his left, uh, the, the Clintons and everybody else looking straight ahead, uh. not paying any attention as if sort of a... But I think president for all of them, even though it was an awkward moment, was this was really more about George H.W. Bush than it was about Bill, right. about, about Trump. Mm -hmm. And I think they kept their emphasis there. Mm -hmm. And I must say, from my perspective, the four eulogies were the finest we've heard in, in political memory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right from the first moment when uh, John Meacham took, took uh, uh, stood up and talked, it, it told that riveting story of how uh, Bush was shot down out of the skies and and was waiting there, you know, and he was miraculously uh, uh, rescued. You, but he lost his two men mm. and he asked that question why was I spared and he spent the rest of his life seeking an answer to that through service right from that first moment to the last moment when George W. Bush choked up mm. and said what my father wanted to do was to go back and hug Robert again and hold Barbara's hand again mm. and I mean, even now just telling the story it is it's moving yeah and, and also the uh, the 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 minister uh, who was with the family when when uh, when the president passed, telling about um, James Baker yes. um, massaging the yeah. feet of the president? You could see on I mean Baker yeah. crying uh, understandably, but I mean such an intimate personal moment. Uh, it was just it was extraordinary to hear. Yeah.
But I think that John Baker would also be uncomfortable comparing that to the last days of Christ mm. and the washing of the feet. I just, that's just not who he is. There's but he was a steadfast friend. By the way, the hearse just yeah. passing the World War II memorial uh, that you see there on the mall. No, he's the guy who snuck in the gray goose. Yeah. <laughs> and, exactly. and the state right. of Norton. He went right. hunting with him. Tim, like Tim, I'm wondering what's done to you. Well, um, I think that powerful image of George H.W. Bush surviving the crash and then thinking about what to do with the rest of his life. Everyone, each of the four eulogists talked about his, his service. I was struck by the fact that George H.W. Bush was the chief architect of a world that is being dissolved now. He is the chief architect of the revitalization of NATO, of the revitalization of the United Nations, of NAFTA, all of the key parts of the post-Cold War world that George H.W. Bush believed were necessary to keep the peace and make the world prosperous. It was beautiful to see that, remi see that reminder. It was powerful. And I, I wondered, as that was being said, what uh, certain members of the audience, those listening, might have thought about the celebration of a world, uh, I would argue, that will not go away, but a world that is now under deep pressure. That was George H.W. Bush's legacy, not just the humanity, not just the decency, not just the dignity, but actual changes in our world. And I think celebrating that today was important. Mm. Mary Kate, as a speechwriter, I'm sure you're yeah, so, uh, so years ago when President Ford uh, died, President Bush gave a eulogy like we just heard just now. And uh, my, my children went to the National Cathedral School and knew all the choir boys. And the choir boys had a vote and voted that President Bush gave the best eulogy. So I sent him a note and said, hey, congratulations, you won the choir boy vote. And he wrote me back and he said, overwhelmed am I, Mary Kate, imagine a guy like me winning the vote of the National Cathedral Choir Boys regarding my eulogy for President Ford. And, and I think, uh, I'm sure, when President Bush gave that eulogy, he was thinking about what can young people learn from President Ford. And you may recall, Ford's uh, funeral, there were Boy Scouts as ushers. Uh, so there were a lot of young people in the audience at the time. And I thought so many times today, what can young people learn from George Bush from this ceremony? I think there probably were a lot of young people watching because uh, I assume some of the schools were closed or schools had them watch it. And the things that jumped out to me were decency, loyalty, humor, uh, love, uh, 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 the high road to humility, as, as Alan Simpson said, and a man who believed in things larger than himself. Many young people want to believe in something larger than themselves. And, and then, as John Meacham put it, uh, making sure that the lives of others are freer, better, warmer, and nobler. Uh, Russ Levinson, at the end there of his eulogy, said you know, that he didn't think this should be an end to an era. And I've thought that a lot lately. Everybody keeps saying it's the end of an era, and that's kind of bothering me. Uh, he said it should be instead an invitation to fill the hole that is left behind. And that's the biggest message to young people is don't see this as something that's never coming back. View this as an invitation to be just like George Bush. But that, that era, that generation of, ser uh, of people who saw service as an integral, as just kind of a given, I, I mean, that it is, it does harken back to it to another time. I mean, you look at you know, again, uh, he didn't have to go into World War II when, when he did. Right. I mean, he could have stayed at Yale and, uh, you know, played baseball and done all sure. the things that a lot of other people... One, one of the things we, we have to come to grips with is the effect of losing the World War II generation on our politics. One of the things that's striking about George Bush is he did not like ideologies. He didn't like inflexibility. That's, he was a pragmatist. Look, he was a, he was a moderate conservative Republican, and he was uncomfortable when people didn't give when they didn't seek compromise. You know, but, but the parties, you know, the, the truth of the matter is that what is going on in our country now is that the Bush party, the Bush Republican party is gone and the Trump Repo Republican party is dominant. And um, I think that this is the struggle that, that is underlying what we, what we saw today without it, without it being mentioned. And, and I think the message from today is Neither one has to go away completely. No. You don't need to vanquish the values of a, of, a, of a Bush to have some of the politics or the policies, if you will, 
of what of what Trump wants, and it doesn't have to be a world war. It's interesting, Tim. You made a point about this: the world, the the international order that President George H. W. Bush presided over, held together. And Brian Mulroney, the Canadian Prime Minister, former Canadian Prime Minister, talked about being the, together at Labor Day 2001, this serenity that the Bushes felt about their personal lives, about where they were. Of course, this is just about 10 days before 9-11, when a lot of that international order uh, collapsed. And it was his own son who, as president, challenged a lot of the things that President Bush 41 stood for as a diplomat astride the world stage. And that tension, president to president, a different generation on either side of, uh, of an act of terror were really striking. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to the World War II generation point because I think it is important to clearly define George H.W. Bush's life. Uh, that is, we had seven presidents in a row, starting with John F. Kennedy, coming through George Bush Sr., who were the World War II presidents. All, all came of age during World War II. Every single one of those presidents wore a military uniform. Mm. Six of them were in the war. Only Jimmy Carter, he was in the Naval Academy when the war ended, and he went on to serve honorably. But that experience shaped him enormously, so that when George Bush Sr. had his inaugural parade, there was a replica of that Avenger aircraft that he was in. Uh, that was in that parade. And that was quite purposeful on his part. Uh, I just want to quickly go back to uh, Dana and uh, Jamie and David Guest. Thank you. We do have a very special guest. We have Ronan Tynan here, who you heard his beautiful uh, voice, not once but twice, during this memorial service. Thank you so much for sitting down with us. It's lovely to be here. Well, sad occasion, but it, Dana, it's nice to be here. Yes, I mean, Jimmy. for sure. And we want to hear about what, what brought you to this moment behind us. But first, you were with the late president, singing to him on his final day. Can you describe that? Well, um, the president and I had have been friends for 19 years and uh, it all came about through uh, Barbara uh, because she ran the literacy program and I had written a book and she asked me would I read an excerpt from it and be part of the program so I did and President, when I got down there, President Bush says to me, he said, hey Ronan, he says, don't think for one second you're getting away without singing. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we became very close and we had a lot of fun and concerts together. Um, a lot of uh, get-togethers in Kenny Bunkport. He was a wonderful man, uh, and you know it was beautifully personified eloquently by all the speakers. He was such a wonderful, loyal friend. And one time he he said to me, he said, "You know, you're like my other son." And I I I, I didn't know I didn't even know how to answer that. I, I I he was just a an amazing amazing man. How did it come to pass that you were in? Texas and yeah, you I, Silent Night <clears throat> um, that last day? How, how that happened? Well, every so often I would ring the, the Bush um, people and ask how he was and and every year I would do a concert in Kenny Bunkport and after we'd go up and have pizzas and stuff like that and they always came to the shows, the two of them. Mm. And a couple of years ago uh, he invited me to Houston and uh, he asked, uh, well, actually, Barbara, he invited me. I had no idea why. And Barbara came down to the, the stairs of the door. She said, do you know why he has you here? I said, no, ma'am, I, I don't. And he said, he wants you to sing at his funeral. And I said, I said, uh, ma'am, I said, that's not going to be today or tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And so when I went into the sitting room when he was there, he says, I suppose she told you. I said, <laughs> she did, sir, she did. And I said, but don't worry, that's all good. And um, so how it came to be that I was at the, in Houston last Thursday, I was speaking at the commencement for Baylor University for the health sciences. And um, I had uh, been in contact with Gene and... Uh, Gene is Gene, Gene Becker, his yeah. longtime chief of yeah. staff. And, and Gene 